Good evening, everyone. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to meet. Sorry for the late um, start of the program. We had some really technical problems here, but by God's grace, that has been resolved. We want to thank you for joining the program. We are a bit um, late, so we'll just go ahead and then start immediately. Welcome and thank you for joining. I want to welcome my dear shepherdesses and pastors and others who are present here. It is my honor to introduce the leaders of the West Central Africa Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. First, please join us in welcoming our president, Pastor Professor Robert Osei Bonsu. Prof. Osei Bonsu is a renowned leader, educator, yes. and theologian who has dedicated uh -huh. his life to serving the Adventist Church. With his vast experience and expertise, he provides visionary leadership to the world, guiding our mission to share the gospel and serve the 22 countries that make up West Central Africa Division. He is also the chair of the Ministerial Association in Word. He will give us a 10 minute devotion before the presentation. Next, we are pleased to introduce our Ministerial Secretary, yeah, Pastor yeah. Dr. Kwame Boachi Kweni. Pastor Kweni is a seasoned pastor and administrator who has served the church in various capacities. As ward ministerial secretary, he oversees the ministerial team, providing support and guidance to our pastors and elders as they serve the churches and communities across the 22 countries in the division. He will do a closing prayer for us. Our dedicated union shepherdess coordinators from the 10 fields of ward are also online. CAUM, CUM, ANOC, Assume SGUC, Northern Ghana, Northern Nigeria, Western Nigeria, Western African Union Mission, and Western Sahel. You are all welcome, and all the ministerial secretaries. A special welcome goes to our interpreters, our Lady Gabrielle Ingi. She's a medical student. She'll be doing the interpretation in French. And then we have Ricardo Fildago who is a professional translator who will do the Portuguese. And then we have Leopoldo Ndog, a teacher who will do the Sp Spanish version. Pastor Edson Montero, the Executive Secretary for Western Sahel, will pray for us. Thank you so much for your help. And thanks to Watara, the webmaster for what? Our dear shepherdesses and pastors and others on board, I know some of us have our family members also listening with us. Welcome everyone. May we gain new knowledge today that will help us as we come across issues concerning this topic. Our facilitator for today's program is Miss Maxine Pam. She is a Ghanaian and a registered mental health nurse at Accra Psychiatric Hospital. She is also an advocate of healthy eating. Most importantly, Maxine is a child of God. We want to thank you, Pastor Osei Bonsu, for making time to join us. Pastor is traveling from camp meeting, but he promised that even if he's not home yet, he will still join. So thank you so much, Pastor. We want to um, begin by praying. And if uh, Pastor Montero is in the house, please kindly pray for us. When Pastor Montero finishes, the next voice you hear will be that of the president who will give us the devotion. And then our facilitator will take us through the program. Thank you so much. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we bless and magnify your name for the opportunity to meet as your children. Your grace has accorded us the time to gather here to learn so that our calling in ministry will be enhanced. 
we ask for your blessings on all those who will be presenting. We pray that even as pastor leads us through the devotion, your spirit will guide and direct and will be giving hope even as we go through the struggles and trials of this world. We commit your daughter Maxine into your hands. Give her utterance and help her as she guides us through what we can do to help those who are in need, where we find our service needed. And Lord, we also pray for all those who are yet to join, that you bring them to join us safely. At the end of this program, Father, may it be to your glory and our blessing that our calling to ministry will be a blessing to all those who come our way. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for answered prayer because we've asked in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Mrs. Odonko, for this opportunity for us to meet here, to study, and to share our views on an important uh, topic, sanity in the sisterhood, sanity in the sisterhood. That is the theme that has been chosen for us, and that is what I want to spend time uh, digesting a bit, and I pray that by God's grace, all of us will be blessed. Thank you very much. And uh, for bringing the various facilitators here to help us understand mental health in order to be well equipped to deal with challenges that, especially our ladies, our spouses, you know, face in the course of their ministry. We beloved sisters, and I'm told there are some ministerial secretaries and brothers in Christ. It is a privilege to be standing before you today to address a topic that often goes unspoken, yet is profoundly significant. We are talking about mental health. Our team, Sanity in the Sisterhood, kind of invites us to explore how we as spouses of pastors can maintain our mental well-being whilst fostering a supportive community among ourselves. The scripture for our meditation this morning is coming, uh, evening, is coming from Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. I'm taking my time so that the interpreters can follow me. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the Bible is telling us not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, that you and I will find ourselves in by prayer and petition or supplication with thanksgiving. We need to present our requests, our challenges, our difficulties, our stresses okay. to God in prayer. You know, the Apostle Paul's words to the Philippians provide a foundational truth for our mental health journey. We are called to present our anxieties and concerns to God. Give it to God. In return, God promises us peace that transcends understanding. Present your anxieties, your concern, your challenges, your difficulties to me. And what is he saying? He has promised us, assured us of peace that transcends understanding. You know, this peace is not merely the absence of stress, but a profound sense of well-being and security in God's love. You know, mental health encompasses our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Mental health affects how we think, feel, and act. 
And it also determines how we handle stress. That is related to others and even how we make choices. As spouses of pastors, we often face unique challenges. What are some of the unique challenges of our spouses, pastors, spouses, shepherdesses? Number one, emotional burdens. You know, bearing the weight of our own struggles while supporting our husbands and the congregation. You see that all of this may bring different stresses and challenges, emotional burdens. Number two, I Segundo. you know, feeling lonely or discomfort. Pour la part de tradition, je voulais m'écouter en français. Si quelqu'un a choisi la langue française, s'il vous plaît, faites-moi s'il vous plaît. Vous négatez. Then expectations. You know, balancing the high expectations placed upon us by others and even ourselves. What are the expectations? À, à me connecter. Euh, merci, Tata Viviane. Euh, nous allons commencer ce programme par. Dentro de la division, enviant de nos messages. Ayo, intentionnellement, ayudar en local traduction en espagnol. Emotional burdens, isolation, expectations. These three may lead to stress. What are the practical steps for maintaining mental health? ¿Cuáles son las, las prácticas I para mantener la salud mental? Yo les recomiendo la oración, la oración y la meditación, and la oración y meditación. And end each day with prayer. Al final de cada día, orar, your in God's presentar nuestras preocupaciones en manos de Dios, promises, eh, meditar sobre sus promesas, meditar en sus palabras, en sus palabras. En Salmos 46, verse 10. 46, he says, yes. be yes. still and know that I am God. My dear, it is, we need to know that God is hermanas, God. Hermanos, we need to leave Dios. our burdens in Debemos His hands. We need to allow Him to carry Debemos our challenges, our difficulties. Be still and know that I am God. Number one, prayer and meditation. Number two, community support. Community support. You need to cultivate meaningful relationships with other pastor spouses. Share your experiences, your joys, and struggles with other, other pastor spouses. You have to create a community of support. You should have mentors. You should have people you can talk to. Galatians chapter 2, verse, chapter 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, 2. Encourages us to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. Can you share your burden with a colleague, pastor, spouse? Can you talk to him hey, about your difficulties, your challenges, community support? All of us need that. Number three, self-care. Self-care. You need to take time for yourself to rest, exercise, and engage in activities that rejuvenate you. I repeat, take time for yourself to rest, exercise, and engage in activities that rejuvenate you. Jesus himself took time to rest and pray. Sit, Sorry, set an right. example. He eh, citado unos ejemplos para nosotros. ¿Y por qué usted no tomará eh, un, algo de tiempo? Number four, seek professional help. Do not hesitate to seek professional counseling or therapy if needed. Proverbs 11.14. Proverbs 11.14 says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advices. You heard me right. Lack of guidance. All of us need guidance. Then limit stresses. Number five, limit stresses. You know, you need to identify 
and minimize unnecessary stresses in your life. Practice saying no when needed and prioritize your task. You know, Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. What is the role of the sisterhood? As a sisterhood, we have the unique opportunity to support each other. Let us commit, my dear ladies, our spouses, let us commit to, number one, listening passion. Sometimes a listening ear is the greatest gift we can offer. Listening with compassion. Number two, praying for one another. Intercede for each other. Lifting each other's burden to the Lord. Meet as a group. Pray together. Pray for one another. Number three, encouraging each other. Share words of encouragement and affirm each other's value and contribution. Like what you are doing today. Come together. Encourage each other. So remember, listen with compassion. If your colleague is having challenges, listen to them with compassion. Pray for one another. Meet together. Pray for each other. Then encourage each other. Sisters, I want to say that mental health is not a journey. We must walk alone. God is with us. With each other. Let's take advantage of the presence of other spouses, other shepherdesses in our lives. Let us embrace the peace of God, support one another, and maintain our sanity in the sisterhood. And I believe, by God's grace, it shall be well with us. I pray God to strengthen you, to empower you, to equip you, to help you cast all your burdens upon him, for he cares for you. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we bow as we pray? Let us pray. Eternal Father, thank you for the gift of community and the assurance of your presence and even peace that comes only from you. As we go forth, may we be instruments of your love and support for each other. I pray that you will strengthen our minds, uplift our spirits, and help us to trust you always, no matter what we may be going through, no matter what may be happen. Strengthen us so that we'll be victorious in Christ Jesus. Thank you for hearing us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you as you continue to serve him with grace and resilience. God bless you. Thank you, Amen. Mama, Amen. for the opportunity. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you, even though you are so tired, but you took Amen. time to join us. God bless you. And bless and you too. Good rest for tomorrow's work. Yes, thank you very you are much. Grateful. You are grateful. So next on the line is our facilitator, Maxine, she will come on and then take us through the program. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Igor Sofobami officially for inviting me to share something about mental health with you. And whilst Pastor was sharing the word, I was like, oh, he said everything I have to say. So maybe after he's done, we would have to just close because he said a lot of things. So I want to say thank you very much, Pastor. I really appreciate you. You've made the work very, very easy. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh
I would like us to nation of the World Health Organization. Health is a state of mental well-being in which the individual is able to realize his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So basically, this is trying to say that in order for you to be classified as someone who is mentally healthy, you should have a healthy mind. You should be able to deal successfully with the life challenges we face on a daily basis. You should be able to handle the stresses of life. Then you should be able to know your strengths and weaknesses. That way you can know how to manage your life. If you know you are good at something, you know how to go about it. If you know you are not good at something, you know how to go about it. And then you should be able to learn and work well. You should be productive either at work or at school. And then finally, you should contribute meaningfully to your community. You could do things <clears throat> that are meaningful, such as hospital visits, such as engaging in communal labor. And as pastors' wives, sometimes we though we may all not be professional counselors, but sometimes we try to advise people with regards to their marriages and all that. So in your church community, you find yourself contributing to that community. So that's all what mental health definition seeks to talk about. Your mental health is a very important part of general health. And without mental health, trust me, you cannot have general health. When I say general health, I'm referring to physical health. Let's say you have to decide to choose between drinking clean water and dirty water. So clean water and dirty water, you have to make a decision. The decision you have to make is based on your mental health. So if you are mentally unhealthy, you may end up choosing dirty water. You will drink dirty water. And in the end, you end up with a physical condition like maybe typhoid, typhoid fever. So it's very, very important. There's no way you can have physical health 100% without attending to your mental health. So they, they work hand in hand. You must try as much as possible to make sure we, we handle them concurrently. Some There's many mental health challenges we go through as women and men, but... These ones listed here, uh, some of them are very peculiar. Apart from the first one, which is depression. Depression affects both men and women. But um, women have depression more than men. So I'm going to talk about depression first. That's a major depression. It's also called major depression. After which I'll talk about the other four, which are peculiar to women. So what is depression? Day in, day out, we hear people talking about depression. I was depressed. I was depressed. Yes, depression is a mood disorder. And it has something to do with sadness. So when you hear someone say, I was depressed, I was depressed, they, they meant to say they were sad. But this kind of depression I'm going to talk about is not, um, it's, it's way above the kind of um, sadness you feel. It's a mood disorder, which is characterized by a state of extreme sadness extreme very extreme sadness it's not easy to get out of that state it can last for weeks months and sometimes years that's if the person is not able to get out of that situation you may have to give some medications to help the person um, to manage the, the situation probably the person cannot get out of it still but you'll be able to manage it up to a certain level so it's not like the ordinary sadness, though it has something to do with sadness. And usually some of the signs that come with it are a feeling of worthlessness. Can you imagine feeling you are so worthless? You have no use in this world. You feel guilty. You feel sad. There's a change in your appetite. There's a change in your sleep pattern. There's lots of interest in activities that you used to enjoy. There's, there are thoughts of self-harm and that there's a, a thought of suicide and some even end up committing suicide. That's when it's not managed early enough. So the change in appetite, for instance, 
people who have depression either eat more than they should or they're not eating at all. And then people who have depression would have change in sleep pattern. They'll either sleep more than they should or they don't sleep at all or they sleep and then wake up too early. And then there is a loss of interest in activities. For the loss of interest in activities, you have people who once enjoyed certain things. Probably you have someone who, who loves singing. The person can be in about four different singing groups in the church. All of a sudden you realize the person is not participating any longer. So it's calls for question. You can ask the person, you, you have to find out why all of a sudden the person is not doing that again. You know, there are some people that when they come to church, you, are, you, you, are, you can't wait to see how they are dressed. They are so conscious about their fashion and all that. But all of a sudden you see a change in fashion and then you wonder what the problem is. And then the thoughts of self-harm, yes, because they feel so useless. They feel they are useless. Why should they live? So they try to harm themselves. Anything at all that can harm them, they try to do it. Either they may cut themselves, they may walk through the street so that a car will knock them down. And then some, as I said, eventually commit suicide. So it's very, very, very important that we take note of these symptoms. Please, let's hold on for a minute. My husband just came in. I asked him to help me with the slides. So I'll, I'll get back to you. Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Okay. Now, now we can hear you. Okay. So I was saying that um, some of the causes and risk factors are that um, people who are exposed to violence or abuse have the tendency of getting depressed easily. And I was using countries that have experienced war. When you go to such countries, you find people who are at different levels of their depression. And trust me, most of them, majority of them will be women. There's also the genetic factor. So when you have twins in the family and one of them gets depressed, there's a 70% chance that the other would also get depressed. When you have a family member who has experienced depression, chances that you might also have it is high. So when you have people around you or close relations, you, you have to be extra careful. So you need to put in more effort to make sure that you don't... And get depressed because you stand a higher chance. And then there are chemical imbalances in the brain. You know, the brain is made up of chemicals. There are some that make us feel happy, some that make us sad. And they work hand in hand to make us live a normal life. Should one be more than the other, especially the one that makes us sad, becomes too much such that the one that makes us happy cannot control it. It results in depression. People's certain personalities, like, such as people who have a low self-esteem, people who are pessimists, people who are easily overwhelmed by stress, can also find themselves getting depressed easily. So the management, usually in the hospital, when they get there, they are put on antidepressants. Yes, and then sometimes they would be has to see the psychologist for psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is a talk therapy. There are different kinds of it. So depending on the kind of um, session you need, maybe you'll be asked to come with um, a family member, your spouse, in an individual therapy, or maybe a group therapy. So for the group therapy, they deal with people who might have similar problems and have overcome them. They try to... Um, let them share their experiences to see how best those who are going through similar problems could also learn from it. For the individual therapy, you see the psychologist and then you go through the sessions, they book you for the sessions until you, are, you have recovered or you are doing better than before. And then um, maybe the family therapy, we have to come with your spouse 
probably whatever is causing the depression has to do with your spouse in a way. So he also needs to be counseled so that together you guys can um make sure things get better for 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 both of you. Even the lady who is depressed, when the when the men also come on board, it, it makes things easier. Sometimes you have to do both medication and then the therapy together. And then there are exercises, not any vigorous exercise, just taking a walk maybe three times a week, an hour for, yes, for about an hour. It's fine. Brisk walking should be fine. When you exercise, there are hormones which are released in the body and they produce, they make us feel happy. They make us feel good. So if you are depressed and you are doing this, it tries to counteract whatever chemical is causing you to be depressed to make sure you are having <clears throat> a balance in life. And then healthy diets, very important. We need to be eating very nutritious and balanced diet. I'll talk about diets more in the latter part. So we we'll just have to go to the next one. Okay, so... This is also a form of depression, perinatal depression. This one is so dear to my heart because it has to do with two people. Perinatal depression has to do with um, the people who get depressed during their pregnancy through to after having a baby. There are some who also have the depression when they finish having the baby. So usually we call those ones postpartum depression. But when they have to do, they have to go through depression from pregnancy through till they have the baby, then we can classify it as a perinatal depression. So um, just like depression, they have almost all the signs and symptoms of depression. And then they also have um, certain peculiar characteristics because there's a baby involved. So they give birth to babies and then it's like they don't want to take care of the baby. No normal mother would do that. They don't want to breastfeed. The baby is crying. They don't care. They think of harming the baby. They they, they just pace up and down. They, they engage in purposeless activities. They pace up and down without aim. They, they just mess up everything in the room. Things that have already been washed, they pick them, put them in water. Everything is disorganized. You realize that there's a problem with this person. So it's very, 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 very important. And some of them end up harming the baby or killing the baby, okay? So when people give birth, they really need that attention. They really need that care. They really need that love. So whoever can come on board to grant this help should do that because these are two lives involved. Okay, I've... I, well, I remember when I was growing up, I, I used to hear stories that people have murdered their babies. Two weeks old baby murdered, and I didn't understand until I learned about this. I got to know that there are people who go through a lot of um, problems after childbirth, and sometimes during childbirth, and then in, they intend uh, extend it to whoever is around them or their babies. So I remember when I was in nursing school, there was a story of a lady who had murdered the child a baby, about three weeks old baby. And she said she 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 was hallucinating. Okay, she was having um auditory hallucinations. So she hears voices, voices which are not there. They are not real. She heard um, the voice telling her she should sacrifice the baby like Abraham did with um, Isaac. So she took the baby and then sacrificed the baby. Unfortunately for her, in her case, a ram was not provided. So it's very, 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 very important that we pay attention to these things. People usually at risk of perinatal depression would be a new mother, someone who has never given birth before. Anything can happen. So they, will be, they may be at risk. Um, an expectant mother with a history of depression. Some people naturally have depression, which wasn't caused by the pregnancy. So if they should get pregnant, it's likely the hormones might trigger the depression again. And then mothers who have gone through stressful life experiences, a pregnant woman who may have lost a spouse during the pregnancy, a, a pregnant woman who um, may have lost their child during labor, 
a pregnant woman who may have lost the womb, some sometimes you go to the labor ward and the condition requires that they may have to take your womb out because you are bleeding excessively. So all these things trigger um, the brain to produce sad hormones, which makes it worse for them. Already they are going through the stress. Or a, a mother who has given birth, instead of going home, the baby has been admitted at an intensive care unit and they have to go sit there. It's very stressful. Sometimes they don't even have the bed. They sit in a chair and sleep by the babies who are on admission. Sometimes you see them with their swollen feet and all that. They haven't recovered themselves. They went to the theater to have their baby delivered. And with the pain and all that, they go through all this stress. So they are at a higher risk of <clears throat> developing depression. The usual causes will be the hormonal changes during pregnancy and after delivery. And then people who worry about parenting, single parents, maybe there's a, a, a woman who doesn't even know how to take care of the baby, who is going to help and all that. It also bothers them a lot and may cause depression during pregnancy. And then, as I said, the complication, mothers who may have lost <clears throat> their babies, lost the womb, or have some other complication during the pregnancy. So just like um, the major depression, in the hospital, they will use antidepressants to make sure the hormones are balanced in the brain. And then a psychotherapy as well. So as much as possible, they will need support from family and friends. So if you know anyone around you who has just given birth, please, and you can give a helping hand in one way or the other. Please do. It's very, very, very important. Okay. I always tell people you should request for the help. Sometimes <laughs> it looks like when you give birth, you want to be the neatest, most organized mom in the whole wild world. Instead of sleeping and resting while the baby is sleeping, then you see cleaning and all that. It's 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 good to clean. But in that, in that situation, if you find yourself not having help, I don't I wouldn't advise that you 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 go on that tangent because no one is going to award you for being the neatest mother, neatest lamb, latest mom in town. Your room is neat when I went to the no, don't think about those things. Your health is very, very important. When you give birth, every three hours you have to feed the baby. Until the baby is about three months old, every three hours, babies can sleep for six hours, eight hours without waking up. So when you give birth, you are being advised to wake the baby up every three hours and feed the baby. So if the baby is sleeping and you know you have to feed in three hours time and you don't rest, you would have challenges. So it's very, very, very important. If you have to take, you have other kids that you'd have to take to their grandparents to for them to, to spend the weekend there or some holidays so that you can have some time to rest. It's very, very necessary. Just bring in people who can help so that you can have your peace of mind. Please, if you have the money, you can you can hire the services of a nanny. Please do. Don't let anyone tell you hiring a nanny is is is, is a lazy is lazy people who hire nannies. It's not lazy people who hire nannies. Maybe the people who are saying that during their time they had someone to help, but you don't have. So if you can afford, please just go for it. It doesn't make you a bad mother. It doesn't make you a bad mother for your health sake. If you get to the stage where you can do it alone, why not? You just take it up and then continue from there. So nutrition is also very important. And then exercise. As I said, the exercise will provide happy hormones. So it will help counteract whatever is going on in the, in the brain. So please, as I said, we need to be resting. Rest as the baby sleeps. If you can't sleep, just lie down by the baby. When it's three hours time, you just wake up the baby and then you feed, you breastfeed the baby. You can join support groups as well. Now and these things are changing in our part of the world. At first, in the olden days, when you give birth, that's it. If anything, you ask your, your mother or your grandparents. But now, realize some hospitals have groups whatsapp groups for postnatal care people who are giving birth and then those who are yet to give birth so they lecture them and tell them things to expect if you have any challenge you can put your question on the page and then they will answer you
And then for perinatal depression, there's a milder form. I'm sure many people would have experienced this one. This one lasts for a week or two, and then it's gone, especially after delivery. When not treated well, it could escalate into perinatal depression, and it's called baby blues. So usually feel uneasy, restless. You feel uncomfortable just at the sight of the baby, the cry of the baby. If you don't, if you don't handle it properly or you don't have people to support you, you might end up in perinatal depression. I have a colleague who is a mental health nurse. She she went through baby blues. She she left Ghana. She the husband is in the States, so she went there to deliver. And she came back. When she came, she was telling me her experience. She was there alone. The husband had to go to work. She said there was a day the baby was crying. Just carry the baby. And then put the baby in the wardrobe and close the wardrobe for some time. And then all of a sudden, something just stood. So she opened and carried the baby. She called the ambulance. She said every 10 minutes she was calling the ambulance that the baby was not fine. But they come and then check the baby. The baby is fine. So it was the the feeling of I am I'm not taking good care of the baby. I am she doesn't deserve me, that kind of thing. She was just confused. She doesn't know what to do. But within a week or two, she was able to bounce back. So that is baby blues. It doesn't last so long like the perinatal. Perinatal depressions can last months. Some people recover. After six weeks, others may have to be on medication for some time to manage it. And then one thing we also advise, most people honestly don't have depression. Their, their depression is only triggered by pregnancy. And the challenge we are having is sometimes with their spouses, the men. When they come and then you try to explain to them that this is what is causing the condition. So as much as possible, if you already have three children, it will be best to put a stop to childbearing. And they don't understand. The men don't understand. Sometimes when you tell the women, they tell you, my husband will understand. You. But it's about you. It's about your health, your mental health. If you should find yourself in such a situation, not, not everyone will want to support you. Not every man. Some of the men are good. They will still be around whilst you are in that state. But some of them will just leave and find others elsewhere. So... As much as possible, she should try. Probably go through some counseling for family planning because your first child, you had perinatal depression, your second child, your third child, and you're looking on going for the fourth time. So please, the, the men, as much as possible, please spread the news. If you have someone who has been through this situation, please, this is a way we can also help. It doesn't mean... It doesn't make it less of a woman if she has two children already or one. And because of this condition, you decide to put it on hold. And this is also dear to my heart. It has mostly has to do with the, the, the teens and then those who are still within their menstrual cycle. Yes. So this is a free menstrual dysphoric disorder. And it's it's um, a state of a state that precedes the menstrual cycle where you have a feeling of uneasiness. And sometimes the symptoms are so bad that it will interfere with your social, occupational function and then your social function. So you have to stay home and then you cannot work. These ones usually begin a week before and then they last longer than the normal premenstrual syndrome where you have headache, abdominal cramps, and then you have to take painkiller and then you are fine. So you'd also go through depressed moods, unexplained tears. They are just there and they, and they are crying. They don't, there's no reason. They are just they, they are not crying because of the pain, but they are just crying. It's also another symptom of depression. Then mood swings, increased irritability. They easily get angry. They are always edgy. So you cannot even go to work. Or if you such a person who goes to the office, they will be fighting with everyone in the office. So it's interfering with their occupational function. And then there's a poor concentration. And there's changes in sleep pattern. So you'll be sleeping more. You'll be in the office in the afternoon. Whilst you should be working, you'll be sleeping. You can't sit and work in the, in the office with this character. 
over a month and then you'll be feeling this way. No. Then changes in appetites, you either be eating more or be eating less. And then conflicts with others. Like I said, either you'll be fighting people at the workplace or in school, any little thing. And then everyone will think with you because every time you have problems with that. So the people at risk um, are women with a family history of premenstrual disorder disorder. So if you're a woman and your mom or your auntie or any other female in your family has had this, you should you should be on the lookout. It's likely you might have it. And then people who have premenstrual syndromes may sometimes find themselves going into the extreme. So you should you should have um you should look out for it as well. And then people with a history of mood disorders. So for the risk factors and the causes, it's definitely a um, hormonal thing. So the fluctuation with of hormones with each menstrual cycle, the fluctuations of hormones is what causes it. That's the, the main cause. So with that, you realize they are not, even at the hospital, they may not be put on any antipsychotics or any medication for depression. Yes, because they believe that it shouldn't last long. Maximum three weeks to a month is fine. But most people recover usually after two weeks of menstruation and then they are fine. So also the changes in diet usually because there's inflammation, there's pain in the breast and all that, it's best to be on an anti-inflammatory diet. So some of the diets which are anti-inflammatory, you try as much as possible to be adding ginger, turmeric, black pepper, cayenne pepper to your food. Anything that would help counteract pain or inflammation, you add them to your diet. Cut down on your sugar as much as possible. Cut when you when you have menstrual pains and you eat sugar, it gets worse. Or you eat too much carbs, it gets worse. So during this period, you should be eating a lot of veggies. Even, even with the fruit, you should eat in moderation because it also has sugar. So be eating a lot of green vegetables <clears throat> more than the carbs. And then regular exercises. Okay, so when you find yourself in the depressed mood, as I said, exercising releases hormones, which makes you feel happy. And then you relax. Very, very important. You need to be relaxing a lot. And then there is a perimenopausal depression. So this is a depression preceding menopause. Okay, there's signs and symptoms are difficulty in sleeping, hot flashes, and then mood fluctuation. So you realize that um, you you lie down and then you wake up in the middle of the night. That's not that's not your routine sleeping. You've always had um, a sound sleep. You don't wake up in the night, but this time you wake up and then you can't sleep again. You go to bed at 8 p.m. by 2, you are up and then you can't sleep again. So it's also a sign that oh, you are you are nearing menopause and the, hormone, the hormones will keep fluctuating until you get to menopause. So it is expected. But when it's in the extreme and it's affecting you, it's... It's not good and may cause depression. And then there are hot flashes as well. So you'll be sleeping in the night, even though you're sleeping in an air-conditioned room or with a fan, you feel sweat all over your neck, your chest, your armpits, and sometimes all over. Your whole body is drenched in sweat. And it's also a sign of um, perimenopausal depression. And usually it's um, women between the ages of 45 to 49 years experience this kind of depression there are hormonal fluctuations as i said those are the major causes and also there may be other causes which <clears throat> in addition with the hormonal fluctuations will make it worse when most of the times you are the ones who care for our sick parents or our sick children so this is the the the, <clears throat> the staying at home for long not being able to go to town to meet other people to socialize is also having an effect on you. Coupled with these hormones, it makes it worse. So it's very, very, very important that <clears throat> we pay attention to um, perimenopausal 
depression because if you already have hormonal challenges and then you're having other things which are even making it worse then you have to find a double strategy of coping with it when you have um people caring for their parents it's <clears throat> And it's, it's such that they cannot even move out of the house. Sometimes you have bedridden parents and you are the only one. You cannot move out of the house. It's advisable to um, probably find some people visiting. If you'd have people from church, you can visit once in a while. There are counseling services online. If you can talk to a counselor online, they will also help. At least it makes up for um, all those times that you've not been able to socialize. And then if you have older children who can step in for you so that once in a while you go out to also socialize, it's very, very necessary. Another reason why people would have um, perimenopausal depression coupled with hormonal fluctuation is because it's the emptiness stage. The children are leaving home and you become lonely, very, very lonely. And probably your spouse is not around. So it's going to have a harsh toll on you. So with the management, usually hormonal treatments, that's what is being done. And then antidepressants. If it's extreme, the depression is extreme. Exercise and then a healthy diet. So eating disorders, another very important one for young people, especially women. It affects women a lot. And Eating disorders have to do with behaviors that are associated with eating, where the person eats extremely too much or does not eat at all, all because the person is concerned about the body image. They want to look a certain way, so they don't eat at all. So one of them is anorexia nervosa, and then it's characterized by self-starvation and an excessive weight loss so the signs of someone who has anorexia nervosa would be that the person will have severe weight loss and then intense fear of gaining weight and then they'll have obsession with size and then persistent behavior to prevent the weight gain then disturbance in self-image so these people Will just eat and then if they eat they will try as much as possible to make sure that what they are eating is not going to have any effect on their weight so they don't want to eat and then everyone is talking my mom is talking my dad is talking so you let me just eat i've eaten for them when they go i'll find a way of getting rid of what i've eaten so they would either be exercising abnormally and then they would try then um, when you give them food, maybe maybe five or two spoons of rice, they will use a teaspoon to be eating so that you feel they are eating so much. But they, they are not really eating. You come back in 20 minutes time, their food is still the same. But they will tell you they are eating because probably they are picking the rice grain by grain. They are just trying so much to make sure that they are not putting on weight. They are very, very concerned about how they look, their body image. There's a, another one, bulimia nervosa. So for them, they are characterized <laughs> by a cycle of binge eating. As for them, they will eat abnormally. They can eat the food that three people can eat at a sitting. They can eat it in a sitting. Yes, they will eat soup just to satisfy their emotions, the way they feel. So they will eat more than necessary. Then in the end, they will go and throw up. They will, they will induce the vomiting. So usually what they do is that they will eat the food and they can't control themselves. When they are done, they will drink laxatives to make sure <clears throat> everything comes out. Or they will fast. If they eat to make sure the next three days, they will, they will eat because they ate more than necessary some days ago. And then they will do that to offset their behavior. And then they're also concerned about their body weight. So the first one, they will eat. They will not eat at all. You have to be forced. Maybe if you force them, they'll try and find means and ways of getting the food out of their body. They wouldn't 
<clears throat> if it's vomiting or exercising too much, they'll do that. But these people who eat very well, abnormally, and they can't control it. If they were telling them to stop, they wouldn't be able to control it. And they know it's not good for them. And they'll still go ahead and find means and ways of getting um, <clears throat> the food out of their body. And then we have the binge eating disorders. So the binge eating disorder <clears throat> are people who usually eat, just like the second one, bulimia. They eat a lot. They eat so much. But for them, they will vomit it out. They leave it like that. They eat because they want to, and, and they eat according to their emotion. They want to satisfy their emotion. You know this thing, people are sad and they're taking alcohol. People are sad and they want to smoke. That is how the eating disorder is. This particular type, the binge eating. So I'm sad, so let me eat something. And they will eat even when they are full. They want to eat in secret because they know they just ate. And when someone sees, the person will complain about you eating. And they will eat until they are uncontrollably full. Then they will experience shame and guilt after the eating. So that's how they will be talking to themselves. Why did I even have to do this? I'm not going to do this again. But give them some few minutes and then it will happen again. That is the binge eating disorder. And all these happen because of one other mental condition or the other, okay? Mostly people who are depressed can go through. That was what I was talking about, um, changing eating habits. Mostly people who are depressed can go through this. And then the people who are having pressure from their family to, hey, you are too big, you are too big. Why are you too fat? That could, they want to remain slim. So then they will do some of these things. Indirectly, it's having a hash toll on them emotionally, but the family members don't know. And then children who have been bullied or body shamed at school, that you are too big, you are too big. And then they would want to avoid food because people will laugh at them. And then our cultural norms, okay, the way we find them, um, the, the way we see um, people on television, in adverts and all that, they usually use slim people. And then we, we, we think that is a standard. So people like to follow <clears throat> that trend. So sometimes they may want to go through this. And then some people use food as a means of coping with negative emotions. Like I said, some people use alcohol. When they are sad, they go and drink alcohol, but they don't know it makes it worse. So the same way people with eating disorders would want to use food as a means of coping. So this is usually for teens. Those who are teens. So as much as possible, we should keep an eye on our teens. When they are not eating and they claim they are dieting, they have some detox teas and all that, we should keep an eye on them because it may be a much more bigger problem than we think. So if anyone in the family has any genetic predisposition to eating disorders, it's likely um someone any it's likely someone else in the family will pick it up. So for them, usually we do nutritional counseling. And then those who have um, any other psychiatric conditions which requires medication, they will, put, they will put on medication. And then uh, they will see the therapist as well. And then because they eat a lot or they are not eating, they come with physical symptoms. So those who are not eating at all will be malnourished. Those who are eating too much may end up with diabetes. Those are not eating, we also end up with ulcer. So depending on the kind of physical symptoms the person presents with, you manage the person accordingly. So do, do you have good mental health? It's a question I would want to ask you. You think you have good mental health. So <laughs> are you able to... Let me see, hold on. Are you able to stick to routines that are good for you? Are you able? I'm asking you, are you able to stick to routines that are good for you? Are you able to live your life despite the difficult encounters you face on a daily basis?
are you able to seek help when necessary or you've made up your mind you don't need help so you are always doing things by yourself Are you confident to handle challenges? Are you an optimist? Are you resilient? Are you able to set and work towards your goals? Okay, so... If you answered yes to at least three of these questions, then you're fine. I think you're fine. If you couldn't answer yes to all, you, you three is enough. You, you can work towards the others. <clears throat> Since you have three, I, I can assure you it will be so easy for you to work towards the others. Then the mental health boost. What are some of the things that we can do to boost our mental health? So engaging in meaningful activities, such as enjoying nature. You could visit people in the hospital. Meaningful is subjective. Anything that you think is meaningful to you, you can do it. Because that is where you feel fulfilled. You get excited when you do them, okay? Someone will want to engage in communal labor. Someone will want to engage in gardening. And that is what is meaningful to them. Positive self-talk and then affirmations. This one is very, very, very important and so easy to do. There are so many times that we have negative thoughts. So positive self-talks help us challenge our negative thoughts, okay? So if you have a thoughts like, I will feel. So I will feel. That's a thought ringing in your head. So you challenge yourself to speak back to yourself. If you're home, you can stand in front of your mirror and tell yourself, I am a winner. I have won before. I can win this too. That is positive self-talk. You challenge the thought. And then affirmation, another good one. So affirmation, especially the I am affirmation. When you use I am, it's like you possess whatever you are talking about, okay? Okay. So you are someone that people see you as quarrelsome. That's what everyone thinks. You can go for an affirmation like, I am peaceful. Okay? You're someone that you think, you find it difficult to forgive because people hurt you. You can say to yourself, I am open to healing. And then you are someone who thinks you're always not getting things right. The way you want it you want it to be of its best but it never happens okay you can say to yourself i strive for joy not perfection so affirmations can be written down you can recite them every morning after your devotion they become part of you a time will come you you don't even have to remember them um, you you can remember them off head without looking on your paper okay so it's very, very important. It helps rewire the, the brain into thinking in a positive way. And then we have keeping a gratitude journal, another very important one. So you write down things that you are thankful for before going to bed every day. You just have a notebook. Even if it's one thing, just write it down, okay? That way, I don't know how many of you realize it, but when you go to bed, you try to think about things that are happening throughout the day before you even fall asleep. If you're able to write one thing that has happened, one good thing or positive thing that has happened, despite all the challenges you've had, you'll be grateful for that, okay? It calms the negative emotion. It leads to a better sleep. When you are firm, it makes you believe that there are good things in the world. And especially, this is very good for people with low self-esteem and they think they are useless and all that when they start writing down their positive thoughts, it changes how they think. It helps them believe that, oh, there are good things in the world and they can come to me. I'm even experiencing some now and I'm even writing them down now. So they are also very important for people who have low self-esteem. And then it encourages acts of kindness because you are receiving acts of kindness from whoever, family, from God, whoever, you also in turn decide to... Um, Reciprocate same to others. 
so that they can also feel the goodness around. So social connections, Pastor talked about social connections, another very important one. So you have church groups, like what we are doing right now, the shepherdess have come together. <clears throat> it's a very good initiative, okay? So they make you feel you belong when you have groups such that you can do things together, learn together, or you have friends that you can go out with once a while, it makes you feel you belong. In fact, when you don't have a good mental health, you cannot engage. You always isolate yourself. Then goals and plans, they help you focus on your targets and not the past. When you have a target set and you have a plan in place, you, you tend to focus more. If you don't have, you may end up focusing on things that have happened in the past. Probably there are some negative thoughts. Okay. Then exercise, physical activity. Happy hormones, as usual, are released when we exercise. And then sleep, very, very, very important. Adequate sleep and rest. At least we should aim for seven to nine hours of sleep because it prepares the brain for the next day. You realize when you don't sleep, I don't know whether you, when you don't sleep the next day, you wake up and you feel some way. It's like your brain is foggy, it's clouded. You, you can't really get things. Even if you try, you might end up having a headache. Okay. Very, very important. Now, there are so many research that have proven that the diet also contributes a lot to our mental health. And one of the major culprits is sugar. Okay. When I say sugar, I'm talking about white sugar, brown sugar, anything sugar, even the carbs we eat. So, very, very important. Already, we are eating white rice, refined rice, which is also causing sugar. We are eating white um, bread, which is also white sugar. Because in the end, the carbs turn into um, sugar in the body for the blood to use, um, for the body to use. It turns into blood sugar. So it's very, very important. If we are eating rice, I don't see why you should be eating white sugar too. Already, the body is stressed with sugar. So we shouldn't be eating white rice and the others whilst eating sugar out top as much as possible. If you cannot do away with your refined carbs, refined carbohydrates like white rice, please find vegetables to counteract them. I always tell people that when you take your plates, you divide it into four, okay? One part, a quarter of it should be your carbohydrates. The remaining half, um, the 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 once left, one part should also be protein, and then the half left should be more vegetables. That is how we should eat. But in Africa, it's rather the opposite. We eat more carbs. We think the carbs make us full, but no. When you have a proper balanced diet or a healthy meal, you realize the body will get used to. So we should add more leafy vegetables, green leafy vegetables like the dandelion, uh, cocoa yam leaves, cassava leaves, potato leaves, everything. We should eat more fruits. And then for those who eat fish, yes, when you are choosing your fish, we should buy a um, wild caught fish. When I say wild caught fish, um, I'm basically talking about fish that are caught in their natural home, not fish that someone has caught from the sea brought it to the house, nest it for some time and all that. Usually when you alter their habitat or where they live, it changes a lot of things in them, okay? That is why I always tell people they shouldn't eat um, tilapia, home farm tilapia. They should eat tilapia from the water lake itself because that is their natural home and you can be sure they are natural. When they move, sometimes the genes are altered and then it brings a whole lot of problems. So it's as much as possible. Let's try to focus on those ones. For those who eat meat, please, you can eat in moderation. But even if you eat, please go for organ meat. Okay? Organ meat like liver. Yes, liver is very, very, very healthy. Because it has a whole lot of nutrients. Maybe later you can read more about it. <clears throat> it has a whole lot of nutrients. And for the wild-caught um, fish, you can be sure to get your omega-3. Omega-3 is very good for the brain in preventing a lot of brain disorders, including um, mental health issues. 
Um, and then for those who don't eat fish, the omega-3 can be gotten from chia seeds. Chia seeds are some small black seeds. They look like, um, when you put them in water, they swell, and it has this jelly nature. It also contains omega-3, which is good for the, the brain. And then we should be eating a lot of whole grains, okay? And then healthy oils. This one is so dear to my heart. I always tell people that a lot of lifestyle diseases are being caused by the oils we are using, like... Um, the refined oils, we are eating sunflower oil, we are eating soya bean oil. I'm not saying those ones are refined. You could eat the unrefined ones and they are fine. Okay, but I'm yet to see unrefined sunflower oil. I think it's very, very rare. And you realize because they've been refined, they're able to stay a very long time. They can last for five years without going bad. Okay, but when you're eating extra virgin olive oil, um, coconut oil, unrefined or virgin coconut oil, avocado oil, and then palm oil, Olive oil is best eaten raw or when the food is cooked. It just needs a little heat and it's fine. When you overheat it, you destroy the nutrient. It doesn't have a high threshold for heat. Coconut oil has a high threshold, so you can use it for frying and all that. Avocado oil has a higher threshold than coconut oil, but it's not common. So most people go for coconut oil. And then palm oil, also another healthy one. So when you prepare your palm nut soup, you could scoop the oil on top that's if you want to be sure you are getting the right palm oil because people say those ones on the market are adulterated unless you trust your source you can you can always buy from them okay so it's very very important it's causing a lot of problems and then a lot of people don't know so as um church members and then pastors wives maybe you have one of your Police coming to you or any other church member because of the position in which you find yourself, they will come and then tell you things they are feeling and all that. You know, it's very difficult to talk about mental health. So when people come, please don't judge them. Okay. Sometimes the things they'll be telling you are true. You feel like, ah, but why didn't you do it this way? That's not the time for you to be saying, but why didn't you do it this way? Okay. Please don't gossip about it. As I said, it's very difficult for someone to take the step and come to you and talk to you. It's very, very, very difficult. So please don't go talking about it. If you need to involve someone else, please seek the consent of the person, the, the person you are talking. Tell the person, well, because of this reason, I have to tell this so that he could be of help as well. If he says no, just leave it. Don't, don't, don't worry yourself at all. Please don't stigmatize them. Most of the time, so when we see people who have mental health condition, we want to treat them in a special way. Please allow them to be. If they are choristers, allow them to be. If they are deacons, and allow them to perform their role. Unless, of course, they are in a crisis and you know it wouldn't be okay for the occasion, then you can intervene that, oh, today, let them, but please let them live their normal life because they can function like normal people. There are people, lots of people with mental health issues. If they don't tell you, you will never know. So please allow them to be. And please don't take their symptoms personally, okay? Most of the times when they're in crisis, they say things, they can insult you and then you feel so sad. But you should know it's a condition, you know? With time, when they get better, they wouldn't be doing that. So please don't take it to heart. Please don't give up on them. It takes time. Usually two to four weeks and over before they are able to get better, Okay. Ways we can support. Be patient with them. <clears throat> Engage them to find ways you can help. You should always ask them how you can be of help. If you can, you should just go ahead and help. Please listen actively, okay? When they're talking to you, please pay attention and listen. This, people who have mental health problems, they read meanings into a lot of things. Like when I'm talking, I was talking to you, you didn't even look at me. You didn't give me an eye contact. You didn't look at me. You, you don't, you're not interested in what I'm saying, okay? So they need to feel loved. So if you're not paying attention to them, they may draw conclusions. Good to learn about mental health so that you find yourself in situations where you can offer help you do it. So just as you are doing, it's very, very important. Now you keep in touch with the person suffering the disorder. If you're able to talk to the person and the person shares whatever problem it is, please 
try and check on the person once in a while. Offer practical help where you can. So if it has to do with um, escorting the person to see a therapist, you can you should do that if you can. If you need to delegate someone, let the person know that I can't go, I can't do it because of this reason. So I'll let this person go with you. And then prayer. Very, very, very important. Very, very important. You should never cease to pray. With everything do prayer and supplication. We should make our petition known to God. Okay. And then with the diet, I just remembered I, I didn't talk about a new start. I felt we are so familiar with it, so I didn't talk about it. But please. So very, very important. Our nutrition, our exercise, our water, our temperance, and then air, rest, and then our trust in God. We should never do away with them. Thank you very, 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 very much. So I'll be waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Maxine. God bless you so much. God bless you too. Thank you. We'll be expecting the questions, but I have one question, then others can follow. You talked about questions. I okay. wanted to ask um, what the effects of the antidepressants are. I suppose that they are given depending on the situation the person is in. But what are the effects? Are they, how long can somebody stay on this um, uh, antidepressants? Okay. Okay, so should I go ahead and answer, or I should wait for more? Yeah, I think you can answer while we wait for the others to come up with your okay. So antidepressants have to do with them balancing whatever chemical is causing the depression in the brain. That is what antidepressants are used for. So usually if um there's a cause, you know the cause for the depression. Like I said, there are people who give birth and then they, they have to <clears throat> go into that state. If after the pregnancy, they get better and they were put on medication, they stop the antidepressant. So it depends on how well you improve or you do how well your condition gets better, okay? I know people who have been taking antidepressants for a very long time. Some of them are probably take it, may take it for the rest of their lives because their condition, as soon as they go off the medication, their condition gets worse as soon as they go. And I know some who have gone off because whatever was triggering that condition has is no longer there, okay? So with them, when they come, you don't just stop instantly. You stop gradually. So if they were taking 10 milligrams today, Maybe the next time they'll do five for some time and then they'll do two and then finally they take them off. And with that, you even advise them to come back if they are seen and, and to see the doctor. If they have any problem, they, should, they, should, they shouldn't hesitate to come back at all. So some can be on it for a longer time. Others can be on it for a shorter time, depending on how best they, they improve. Okay. Thank you so much. Please, if you have any question, kindly raise uh, your hand. Use the go to the chat uh, uh, portion and then indicate by picking the hand sign, and then we can coordinate how the questions will be. And uh, you know, I will be asking the question. So, and the first person here is Doris Nyaku. Doris mute and then ask your question. Hello, Doris. Okay, we can also drop our questions on the chat. As they come on the chat, um, she will read them and then answer them. Okay, um, I'm not giving you Galaxy A1, A12.
Um, good evening, mom. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, this evening we are so grateful to have you. And I have followed it a bit, though there is a network challenge here. But I have learned a lot, especially we women throughout our lifestyle, everything of us is pain and depression. So we need not to find ourselves or to give another pain to ourselves. You know, from the beginning, right from the formation of our breast is pain, down to the menstrual cycle pain, giving birth, everything of us is pain. So we go through a lot of depression. And I hope our husbands will bear with us. Um, um, here, I'm here with my husband, though he has just left. And we also had everything. Okay. We thank you so much for taking thank us you. through. And I'm also urging our shepherdess, as you said, in fact, we should be happy. We should live a happy life, not eating the oily food and all that, but at least we should have friends within the shepherdess. We shouldn't be loggerheads with each other, so like that you see your fellow and your, your high pressure will begin to rise. No, we are, we are fraternity, at least. We, we should be friends. We should love one another. We should chat. We should do things together so that we will live a happier life. And I know with this, it will help us to go a long way by prolonging our lifestyle. God bless you so much. We are so happy Thank to you. have you. Thank you once Amen. again. Amen. Amen. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I'm checking the... Okay, um, we don't have any any hands asking him any questions. Okay, so if we don't have any questions, um, Maxine, can you give us a last word? Okay. Please, I have a question, I don't know. I wanted to raise my hand. <laughs> okay, you can ask a question. Okay. Uh, my question is, most of the shepherds are working hard. Uh, sometimes some depression can be caused also by loneliness. You know, sometimes our husband, they are on the feed. And uh, sometimes the mother, the wife, the, we are everything. Okay. There are some, some of our husbands, they are traveling. Maybe you have them once, uh, twice. Sometimes they are on the feed. They are seven. Uh, we know what I'm, you people know what I'm talking about. But wait, how, what can we do to help these women, these mothers that are struggling that they don't have anything, uh, let me say, they don't have any work, maybe maybe because of a, a affectation, trans, a transfer. So they are always having this problem of meeting up their needs and it can cause depression. What can we do? What is the plan of the church to help shepherds in order to make their ends meet? Okay. That is one of the aspects. That is my question. And another thing, again, that I also like to share you, we are talking about how can we, uh, a hormone, when the hormone is reducing. Yeah. You mentioned so many things, but I also want to add uh, uh, this thing, uh, to uh, tobacco, I don't know, how do you call it in English again? Uh, this thing. It's to buy, uh, this thing, I like... Um, cassava cassava yeah cassava boiled one not uh, uh, the one that French here they would like eating manure that is when it has been transformed to fufu but if you can eat it as Ghana I love Ghana because they eat it 
they pound it and eat the cassava timber. It is very good to raise hormonal, uh, to raise up our hormones because as we are growing old, the, the hormone is reducing as well. So we need a lot of potassium. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So with the issue of um, some shepherds not working because they've been transferred and all that, yes. So this is a great opportunity to um, draw the attention of Pastor Segun. So please, <laughs> I think you should do something about it because, yes, it also has an effect on the mental health, okay? At least when your spouse is not around and you keep moving around, you should be rest assured that. Wherever you find yourself, you have something doing, no matter what, no matter how small. So please kindly consider it as well. I'll be very happy to hear that this has been taken up and then there are some changes which have been made as well. All right. Thank you. We will look into <laughs> that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. And then we have Esther. Esther, can you ask your question? Thank you. I just want to appreciate God on your life, in your life for this presentation. May the Lord continue to be with you and your ministry and the presentation, the presenter. Please, I want you to check the chat. We have some questions there. Maybe they can help us to address those two questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm sure. I'm seeing the chat. Okay, someone said a friend of mine after Beth has gotten piles and the anus is causing serious worry. Any help? So you have mm. to go to the hospital. Yeah. You have to go to the hospital for a doctor to see. Maybe it, be, it may be something else and not piles. Okay. Okay, so I think that is the only question there. Then uh, the Wendy. Let me see. The other one is encrypted. Wendy, Ajewa. One question, no. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much for such insightful presentation. Thanks. And my question is, uh, what causes papyrus psychosis? And this is my submission. Um, our church members, the women, usually think that the shepherdess have solution to virtually every problem. So, Anytime they get a problem, they come to us. Um, I will urge all of us to be mentally stable by praying to God um, to give us. Okay, internet is not. Any challenges? Oh. I think she there's a challenge with the internet. Some people are having Has that strength okay. and people who will be easily forgiven uh, so that most of their problems are to be referred. And uh, our hmm. urge all of us led by a physician, we should do so. So Okay, I think uh, she's having some challenges with the internet. Um, okay. Okay, hello, so Wendy. She was asking about peripheral psychosis, yes. So peripheral psychosis is similar to um, perinatal depression. It all has to do with pregnancy. So usually peripheral psychosis is before, if, during the stage of pregnancy. You start experiencing some mental health symptoms, behaving abnormally, hallucinating, hearing voices that are not there, seeing things that are not there. And it all boils down to hormones, okay? Yes, but now they've all been put under um, perinatal depression because they have similar signs and symptoms. So <clears throat> if the person comes to the hospital, depending on the signs and symptoms the person is exhibiting, they know whether to classify it as a, a psychosis or a depression. The difference between a psychosis and a depression is that usually psychosis, they are the people that present with hallucinations. They are seeing things which are not real, hearing things that are not real. P 
people who have depression may not have that okay some of them may some of them but majority of the time they don't so they've all been classified under um perinatal depression so when you see peripheral psychosis perinatal depression they are all mental health issues and they are all being caused by the hormonal fluctuations Okay. okay, okay. I'm seeing okay. another one here. Can depression cause one to lose interest in sex? Yes. When you your hormones are intact, you there's no way you have problems with sex. When you start seeing that's why people say when you get go to um you get to the menopausal stage, you start having a decline, <clears throat> a feel a decline in the feeling for sex because the hormones that are supposed to make you feel are no longer there or they are diminished. The um, things that are supposed to prepare you for sex, like helping you cause um, 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 lubrication in your vagina, the hormones that are responsible for it are no longer there. So you have a dry vagina and then you are having sex and you are not enjoying it. So depression can also cause that. If the hormones that cause um, you to prepare for sex are also affected, and there are some people too, during that stage, that is when probably they would even have <clears throat> a high libido, abnormally high libido. Yes, but most of the time, majority of the times, you can have lots of interest in sex. Okay. I see that uh, there are no more hands uh no more questions we want to say thank you so much to maxine for giving us such information we pray that each one of us will use what we have gained today as we work in the vineyard i know that um, sometimes church members expect us to be everything they come to you for everything. But one thing I want to encourage us is that do what you can and what you cannot do, refer. As we have been told by Maxine, ask the person for permission. Uh, this is what I can do for you, do that. And what you cannot do, tell the person, will you want me to refer you to so, so, and so for help and all that refer and always pray for the people personally who come to us as much as it lies within us. One of the best things we can do for our church members is never to judge them and never to gossip about their challenges. Never. We should. May God help us to be the mothers of the church members as he has called us to be. So we want to um end the program now by the grace of god um we have pastor queenin in our miss pastor queenin is a ministerial secretary for word so pastor is going to give us the last words and he is going to pray for us magazine thank you so so much oh, god bless you so mommy. much Yes, God bless you. We are really grateful. God bless you. Pastor Queenie, Pastor Queenie is my direct boss. Pastor, oh, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to express our profound thank you to our two presenters. Mazin, you have made our day. We have gotten a lot of lessons from you. In spite of the challenges, we are very much glad and pleased to have you. I hope you are going to come again. Oh, you yes, are not I going to that. end. <laughs> ah, we'll be very happy to see you. And then we will enjoy and enjoy more. We see there are many men, uh, pastors, yes. very present in the program. We love our wives. We want them to experience good health. Mental health is so important to us. Again, we also want to express our deep appreciation to our president, Professor Osei Bonsu, 
uh, thank you so much, Prof, for that insightful presentation, leading us with the word of God. We don't need to be too much anxious, things that we need to remove from our brains. So we hope that next time uh, we are going to be blessed again by another wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. All of you, we are glad to have you. We are very happy. Uh, we are very much appreciative of your presence. Next time, we will also run another program. Please come and grace the occasion. Take so many lessons. Shall we bow for prayer? Merciful okay. oh, Father, our kind and our loving God, we are so much thankful for today and tonight. The blessings that you have given to us is overwhelming. Thank you so much for this sense of togetherness to learn under your feet. We bless your name for the ministry of Mazin. Thank you so much for using your maid servant. Lord, permit us to place her before your merciful throne. Shower your bountiful blessings upon her and take full control of her home. Make her special. Edify her ministry to your glory. We want to thank you for the wonderful presentation of our president. Continue to bless your son. In spite of the tie shadow, manifest your presence with him and the entire home. Lord, each and every one of us, you have entrusted to us credible ministry. We need health. We need protection. Some of us who are going through crisis, we want to mention Pastor Koroma. We want to mention Pastor Bain. We want to mention... Onuya Ode, many of us, even our children, we plead in the name of Jesus Christ, take them out of all these challenges, mental health challenges, Sorry, and keep them health, and bless them, said that all of us witness massive health in order to spread the gospel message, even as we have what in 2025 ahead of us. We want to see healthy people doing mission for you to glorify you help and bless our home support us so spiritually we will know you in all things make us prayerful make us loving make us blessing to people edify our social life thank you for the blessing today as we sleep give us sound health in the name of jesus christ amen 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 amen, amen. 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 Thank you so Amen. much. Good evening. Amen. Amen. God bless Amen. you all. Amen. God bless Amen. you all. Amen. In Nigeria Union Conference. God willing. Next Amen. Week. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Mama. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night.